we haven't done one of these for a, a bit because we were traveling. Uh, at least the office staff was traveling. So I'm delighted that we're back on the screen. And uh, we obviously couldn't get Larry in for an in-person because he happens to be in Texas. But uh, I think this is a good, a good subject to bring us back together on because there many of us are either doing it, have done it, or will do it and the teaching mode and uh, and we get new people all the time while we've got everybody on the screen i just want to note uh most of you are probably aware but on the academy website there are some teaching resources uh there is uh, there's a memo on teaching from a workshop we did quite some time back the most valuable thing i think are the uh, uh, syllabi that we've collected from many of you. We're in the process. I think we're still updating and posting, but in any event, there's a long list of, of syllabi on our website, and you can go through the index and click on the ones that look like they might be interesting. And if you have to do a new course, uh, or you just want to see what some of your colleagues are doing on similar courses, it's a great resource. So having noted that, and noting to any of you who have a syllabi that you have not sent us, uh, please do send it into the Academy address. With that, uh, with the usual lack of introduction, Larry, over to you. Uh, great, Ron. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with so many uh, friends uh, from a uh, long time. And uh, I just thought that uh, now Maria and I have been, and Ron have been talking about setting this up for some time, but it, I think it does come as a good time because we've had just weeks of, of dispiriting and tragic events in Afghanistan and now the somber remember, remembrance of 9-11 this past weekend. And uh, I don't know, I, I for one welcome an, an hour just discussing uh, what I think is a more, more hopeful topic. Uh, so, and that's the rising generation of American diplomacy. What can we say about these young people who are coming up um, and uh, are there ways in which we can assist them in uh, realizing their aspirations. So my impressions of this generation are based on uh, 17 years of, uh, of teaching at the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at Texas A&M. But I know many of you have uh, equal or, or much greater experience uh, with this generation of aspiring diplomats, at universities, at think tanks, NGOs, and any number of other settings. So I really, I really look forward to this as a discussion and hope to hear, learn from you about uh, what you see in them and, and, uh, and how we can, we can be of help. So what can we say about this, uh, this group? Well, first they have, in my view, uh, faced an almost unprecedented, and I think it is unprecedented, uh, headwinds in pursuing their, uh, their aspirations for a career in diplomacy. And those headwinds just about have amounted to a, almost a hurricane of adversity that they, they have encountered. First, they, first they had the, we had the hiring freeze and the general uh, slowdown of hiring for diplomacy uh, during the previous administration. And then before, uh, and then, then of course, the COVID-19 uh, hit us, uh, causing a, a virtual shutdown of foreign service recruiting for extended stretches. Uh, the collapse of the department's uh, uh, signature uh, internship program in 2020 and the limitations of internships to virtual only in 2021 and now po possibly in 2022 as well. Um, the real slowdown, almost a glacial pace of onboarding of applicants who do make it through uh, and the uh, near, what I consider a near breakdown of the security clearance uh, process and the, uh, and just generally the the very difficult and daunting uh, foreign service exam uh, process made even more so when, for instance, uh, you, when you get, we had to suspend, uh, the department had to suspend the, uh, the oral assessment, which is the third and final uh, 
phase of the Foreign Service exam un, uh, until vaccination uh, became available. So from where I sit, uh, I think it's remarkable uh, how many of these, of our best students remain resilient and determined to fight it out uh, for a career in American diplomacy against really some of the longest odds we've seen uh, in a long time and across what's likely to be years of hard slogging and persistent effort. And uh, I think whatever we can do in terms of mentoring them, in terms of encouraging, in terms of helping them navigate through, the, through these headwinds that they're facing uh, is something that each of us can do in whatever situation we find ourselves, whether it's in, in uh, teaching or whether it's in an NGO or a think tank or wherever we encounter these remarkable uh, young people. Uh, second, I think, it's, I think it's really striking how much of this uh, generation remain uh, committed to doing hard things in hard places. They do have myriad, of op myriad options out there. Uh, they can go to law school, they can go to a PhD program, they can certainly go into the private sector. But I find many of them are, are, are still mo are motivated by a powerful ethic of public service. And thankfully, many, many of these best uh, aspiring public servants uh, see their future in, in American diplomacy. So just to take our, our example at the Bush School, and you have many, many, many more uh, where you are, uh, our, we have Bush School graduates uh, that uh, either have served or are serving in American embassies in Russia, China, Pakistan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Mexico City, and many more, as well as in the department in Washington. And as I say, I'm sure that many, many of your students, your interns, uh, and your mentees have made uh, similar uh, commitments. On the flip side, I I do think that this generation expects a commitment from employers, including the State Department that responds to their aspirations for what they view as an appropriate work-life balance. Uh, many in this generation have relationships in which the other partner uh, has significant professional career ambitions that are, that are just tough to realize and to square with the commitments of a worldwide availability in, 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 the, uh, in the State Department and American diplomacy. Issues such as telework, parental leave, elder care, transparency in assignments and promotions, and of course, diversity and exclusion, uh, or inclusion, sorry, about which I will say more about later. They loom really large in, in the retention of this uh, generation of aspiring diplomats. I mean, we've there have been some progress on this. There's been considerable progress. I just talked to, happened to talk to a Bush School student, a graduate this morning, uh, who's uh, now in Mexico City as a, uh, as a diplomat. He and his wife are there, they're a tandem couple, both from the Bush School and both now serving in the Foreign Service. And uh, uh, they just had a baby in Mexico City and are now on 12 weeks parental leave. Well. Uh, I mean, that's a huge step forward. It didn't exist until last year. And uh, obviously, you know, we never had it in our time. And, and uh, it's just an, uh, that, that kind of thing is what we need to do across the board in our foreign affairs agencies and in the State Department if we're going to uh, not lose uh, many of this uh, gifted generation to our competitors in the private sector and elsewhere. Third, I'm, I'm struck by how many in this generation really are remarkably smart and savvy and imaginative and, and poised. They've, they are, uh, they've, they've been, they've gone to school a long time and they've made the most of it. Uh, and they really are uh, intellectually sharp and, and, engaging. They're politically and uh, active and, and many of them are committed to their views, but I find them refreshingly less prone to the partisan combat and ideological orthodoxy that affects so many of their grandparents and, and parents. 
maybe I'm naive on this point, but I, I but they, uh, they, they more often than not, much more often than not, give me hope about the future of our politics and our diplomacy. They have had plenty of academic training and accomplishments, but on the whole, they, they retain the intellectual curiosity that's indispensable to an open mind. They're willing to learn, they're, they're eager, in fact, uh, to learn. They write well, they write their research papers well when they're asked to do that, but they don't have much experience in writing to achieve an immediate purpose, to get a decision from a boss, to prepare a principal for an engagement with a counterpart, or to brief a decision maker too busy to read more than a couple of pages. So this is an area where I think we can really be helpful to this rising generation. If we can structure situations in the classroom, in an internship, or on the job where they have the opportunity to practice the skills of writing for a purpose uh, that we acquired mostly through on the OJT, on the job uh, interaction and training with more senior leaders. And one of the things that I found very useful is if I can structure a simulation uh, that gets them in, in, in the classroom into uh, interaction in uh, as close to a diplomatic setting as I can structure it, and then have them write for that purpose, uh, that this is a good way for them to uh, get, to acquire that kind of experience in writing. And many, so many of my students have uh, come back and, and, uh, and, and, and let me know that this is a skill that's portable. It moves with them, the, the ability to take a whole lot of disparate information, boil it down, uh, into a couple of pages and, uh, and write so that it achieves a purpose uh, is, is portable. It goes from job to job, agency to agency, setting to setting, and uh, it's, uh, it's an extremely useful part of a practical education for diplomas and many other uh, aspects of national security. Finally, uh, this generation, as all, all previous generations, will not fully succeed in, in reviving American diplomacy without a solution to the generations long problem of diversity and inclusion. You know, we all know the State Department's struggles on this issue uh, with not near enough success to date. But, uh, you know, the records, the record of colleges and universities from which the department recruits has, off, all, has sometimes also been part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Uh, Destiny, I wonder if you could throw that chart up there that I asked, that I sent you earlier. Yep, it's on there. I'll just give it a second. Yeah. Okay, okay. so. Uh, just as an example, many of you could cite other examples, and I, I hope even more hopeful examples. This is diversity in the Bush School in International Affairs and uh, Admissions. And uh, on the right, uh, my right as I'm looking at this, also the Foreign Service record by gender, race, and ethnicity, uh, with this, the source being the uh, GA, recent GAO uh, uh, report, extensive GAO report on these issues in the, in the State Department. As you can see, there's, uh, at least at the Bush School, there's, there, we've had some success and some, uh, and we, but we got, a long, we got a long way to go. Our principal success has been, uh, I think, encouraging uh, more uh, female applications and admissions uh, to the Bush School in International Affairs. As you can see, for a number of years, we've been in the strong 40s. And in the last two, uh, we've actually uh, topped 50% and, and sometimes substantially over 50% in, in uh, women uh, in our school. And, and we're, very, we're very pleased with that. We, our record on African-American and Hispanic uh, admissions is, is much, less, mess, much less impressive. And in fact, uh, it's it's a problem, and I don't mind I don't mind saying that. Uh, 
the as you can see, the numbers uh, are have been better in Hispanic uh, admissions than in African American admissions, but neither one is up to the scale uh, of those groups as they are represented in the population of the United States or of Texas. Uh, African Americans make up about 13% of the US population, about the same in Texas. 18.5% uh, in the US population and 40% uh, in Texas. And as you can see, we're well south of those numbers uh, throughout, throughout the period. Now, you know, I know, I know that we're talking about a, a state university in Texas. We have a historic legacy of, of segregation and education to overcome. And, and uh, frankly, <laughs> some of the current, uh, some of the current initiatives of our legislature in Texas have not, not helped out uh, in that regard. So we've got work to do, and we know we've got more work to do. Uh, we have a vigorous and, and, and really a, a, a comprehensive diversity and inclusion effort led by our Dean, Mark Welsh, which we are conf confident over time will, will make a positive difference. And I, I really, uh, I, I know, and I, and I uh, would look forward to hearing about uh, the more positive records that many of your institutions on uh, have, have made on African-American and Hispanic uh, admissions. The, I will note that for most years of the, that you can, if you go across from the chart uh, to uh, the State Departments, that uh, the Bush School admissions on uh, African American and Hispanic uh, students, uh, you know, try, unfortunately, uh, track pretty well, or or at least uh, track uh, on on the same low side with uh, with the State Department's uh, African American and Hispanic numbers. So it's clear that there's plenty plenty of more work to be done here. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that uh, the, uh, we, if we talk about what the Biden administration is uh, doing on this, uh, we, there, there is a new uh, National Security Memorandum number three, which dates from February 4th of 2021. Which does I don't know Destiny did you did you get that Yes there it is So you can certainly uh, you can certainly get this It's a it's several pages of text and so I'm certainly not going to go through it in detail or or read it But it does set up uh, an interagency working group under the the uh, principal deputy the national security advisor John Finer uh, to look at a number. Of these issues and to report back uh, to the administration uh, and the president on those issues. So among the things that uh, that the uh, NSM asked the group to take a look at are addressing critical staffing needs, uh, especially in, uh, in science and technology, strengthening diversity and inclusion by sex, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, and uh, and the like, to develop some uh, lessons learned from the COVID-19 uh, experience on things like remote work options, adoption of secure remote technology, uh, and flexible work arrangements, to, uh, to work on efforts to uh, retain, develop, and promote, and support national security employees. So some work on assignments, provision of affordable family, uh, child and family care, support for those serving overseas and their families, including with LGBTQ members and with those with special needs, and uh, to what, assess what can be done about really the, the broken uh, security clearance uh, process that we've all uh, 
all experienced in our careers and, and uh, it's, it hasn't gotten any better. So we've all had plenty of experiences with national security memoranda. Uh, sometimes they, they go on the shelf and they uh, don't achieve very much. They, they gather dust and, and uh, are become relics along the way of the, of the, uh, the national security record of an administration. But at least they do show something of, of the priorities going in. And I find uh, that the fact that this uh, national security memorandum was, uh, was, was authorized on February 4th, early in, in the process, uh, at least uh, shows some uh, attention to some realization of the fact that uh, these, some of these issues need urgent attention. And, and uh, maybe, maybe it'll, it'll pan out to something uh, that, we, that we can uh, look forward to. So I want to sum up and I, I want to finish on a thank you, Maria, I appreciate it. On a, uh, on a real positive note, I think, uh, of optimism about this rising generation of American diplomats. And in that, in that spirit, I would like to close with a very brief quote from what I think were the best remarks that were delivered on the occasion of the 20th uh, anniversary commemoration of 9-11. The remarks given by uh, uh, President Bush, George W. Bush at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And in, that, in those remarks, he said of this rising generation, at a time when some viewed the rising generation as individualistic and decadent, I saw young people embrace an ethic of service and rise to selfless action. That is the America I know. And it's the America I know as well as regards this, this uh, rising generation. So, Ron, over to you. <laughs> well, I'll be happy to pick, pick speakers. Uh, we got enough people on the screen that it would be helpful. Go back for the other view. Uh, be helpful to uh, have hands raised in the chat if you can, uh, but otherwise, we'll raise, waving them at the screen may may miss. I may miss you. Um, so let me see. I gotta get our own view. Yeah, uh, here we got. I got. I got Ken Yellowitz who's still trying to figure out how to do an electronic hand raise, but I saw him. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Larry. Thank. Can you hear me? Yes, Ken. Got gotcha. you. Great. Uh, that was terrific, Larry. And I, I, my experience, you know, has been very, very, very similar. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of things. One, um, I have found in the classroom, you know, the last couple of years, um, a great deal of consternation and puzzlement. You know, when we teach diplomacy and the formulation of national security policy as we know it, uh, talking to people who are, you know, totally confused by what the Trump administration did uh, and sort of the lack of planning, the lack of procedures, the disdain for the Foreign Service. And I think that's one thing that I think we're going to need to, um, you know, to think about for the future uh, is dealing, you know, with that legacy. Uh, uh, as I said, I, I find that the young people are still very enthusiastic, very gung-ho as you are, but I think also uh, a number of them are just dispirited, you know, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, perhaps this profession, uh, you know, is, is not quite, you know, what, what we had hoped it would be. And the other thing, when you talked about mentoring, I mean, I totally agree with everything you said, but I find in the teaching, in addition to, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, getting people to focus on writing, I always have my writing exercises, never have footnotes or bibliography, or the whole idea is writing, you know, with a purpose. Um, but what I find is they don't like to listen to all your war stories, but your war stories, that help teach a lesson uh, is invaluable. And I think the lesson that I've learned is not to overdo it, uh, but to use your valuable experiences and what they really seem to enjoy 
is when you've talked to a president, the head of a government, when you are talking about you know, being the United States, you know, representative, you know, with a head of state across the table, what is that like? You know, what what goes through your mind? How do you prepare for it, uh, and how do you deal with it? Uh, but I totally agree. My experience now at uh, Georgetown and also Dartmouth, with many going into the Foreign Service, is that they are still the best and the brightest. They are still committed, but I think they've been singed a bit you know, by what, what has happened. And now, of course, as a result of Afghanistan, you know, we have more questions, but terrific uh, presentation, Larry, and thank you. Yeah, Ken, I, I agree with you uh, totally. It's really hard to, uh, to teach the national security uh, decision-making apparatus because it's so archaic in many ways. I mean, we're, we're, we're still operating basically off, uh, well, you know, the constitutional basis, which is very thin, and then the National Security Act of 1947. And as I tell my students that that's nearly, as, I mean, that's older than I am, just a little bit older than I am. And I'm not working very well anymore. And, and the thing just, uh, in, in matter of fact, what I say to my students is, the miracle is not that it works poorly, the miracle is that it works at all. And, uh, you know, but it's nonetheless what we have. And uh, notwithstanding the great work by Marcy and others who've made uh, many uh, suggestions for fixing it, uh, those never seem to, to get very much traction in, in trying to bring a, a, a so 20th century uh, decision-making process into something approximating a 21st century one. And I think it does frustrate the, this generation of students who can just see a better way to do it. And, and wonder why it's the way it is. I wonder whether the best or way to do it would turn out to be the same better way to do it if they had their chance. But Pete Romero. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I agree, Larry. Uh, I, I think this younger generation uh, has got a lot going for it. Um, it's very enthusiastic. Uh, it is a much more equitable generation in terms of fairness, uh, in terms of giving back. You see all over advertising on a daily basis, whether it's Cheerios or whether it's uh, detergent. Uh, people trying to explain how they give back beyond just the business part of all of this. That's the younger generation. They really care about that. And, and, I, and I have to admire them for it. Um, I think their skills are just as good as everybody else uh, that has come through that I've ever, ever had a chance to, uh, to be in the classroom with. Um, but I think that there's some things that, that you didn't mention and, and that concern me at least. And, and that is, with respect to diversity and inclusion, I get a lot of um, the State Department is not is not diverse and it's not inclusive. So I'll go elsewhere when it comes to uh, gender and minority candidates. Uh, and uh, I obviously in this current state of um, very very low unemployment, they have that ability to to pick and choose, and you know I I, I laud them for it. But there's, there's not the same kind that I can see dedication to changing something like the Foreign Service, like our diplomacy, like getting diversity and inclusion in uh, at all costs. I don't, I don't really see that kind of dedication. And the other thing is, I was thinking the other day, when I was a, a very, very young teenager, and I, you know, I want to say like 13 years old, the leaders in our country were in their 40s. Where are those people now? And I just don't understand why there haven't been clearly more younger leaders emerging from political parties from all over the country, including in the Foreign Service. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that, that the generation is really risk averse. Those are those are great comments, Pete, and I really appreciate it. And I, I you know, I think you're right. We we have to realize that we are in a, something of a marketplace here uh, for the talents of this generation, and uh, there will some, you know, they will be prone 
uh, to go somewhere else if they feel like that they're, uh, especially if they're uh, young people of color or who are not uh, represented in, in, in the, anywhere near the right numbers in, our, uh, in the State Department and in the national security agencies. They may well, they may well say that, uh, that uh, look, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take my skills uh, elsewhere. I find that we have a hard core of, of people who do wanna change the system, who wanna come in there, who want to be a part of American diplomacy, and it'll be hard to turn them off enough to make them go away. But I, it's not a fully elastic, we're not, we're not dealing in the situation of full elasticity here. There will come a, a breaking point where we're going to, you know, to lose, uh, to lose some of these, uh, these gifted young people. So I agree with you uh, on uh, almost everything you said there. Yes. John Kip, please go ahead, unmute. Go. Thanks very much, Larry. Excellent presentation. I, I, my question is basically a, a spinoff of what Peter said. Um, you know, this issue of why we can't recruit talented African-American, Hispanic minority officers in general uh, is something that goes way back. You, you'll remember when we were back on the Soviet desk, uh, right before it ceased to be the Soviet desk, we tried very hard to recruit uh, young foreign service officers who to go to Moscow. Now, it was particularly difficult for African Americans because the Russians uh, had a history, not just of racism, but of actually uh, uh, toughs beating up black uh uh, people in the society. Many of them were African students who'd come to Patrice Lumumba the University, as I remember it. But even back then, uh, and this is now 20 odd years ago, we had a difficult time. Now, I know there's people on this uh, video, Marcy and others, who've worked really hard to try to figure this out, but it's not just a question of job availability. There's something much deeper here, and I'm just curious if you could comment on this um, as you see it from your uh, perspective down in uh, Texas these days. Thanks. Uh, John, it's great to see you. And uh, I do remember those times and in, in, in exactly the efforts we made to try to recruit young people to go to Moscow. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a question that has certainly bedeviled me a lot. Uh, why is it that it is so hard? Uh, and I, I don't have a fully satisfactory answer, but I think one of the things is uh, it's just been very difficult for us to get to, uh, to younger, uh, for the State Department, to get to younger African-American youth as they are coming up. That's why one of the uh, good proposals that I think Marcy and her team came up with and others have made it as well, to do something like an ROTC, a state or, I mean, a, uh, yeah, State Department ROTC program, where maybe we could, uh, attract some of these younger people, especially in, in inner cities and places where the uh, black and Hispanic communities are, are, are very prominent uh, into something that would be fun for them to do, something that might appeal to them more than, than, than the military uniform or the, or the ROTC uh, uh, framework that would get them interested in global affairs, but that would uh, help them see a future for themselves in our profession. So I, I don't have a great answer. I hope that others would uh, would contribute to this as well. But it, I mean, it's a tough nut to crack. We've done better with Hispanic uh, applicants, at least at the Bush School. Now, maybe that's because we have so many, uh, we have such a, hard, a, a high level, our percent of, of Hispanics in the population in Texas. But uh, our, our record of attracting African-Americans to the Bush School has just not been good. I was hoping that others would say, oh, ours has been much better. Uh, and many of them have been, uh, uh, our Pickering and, and Wrangell, uh, which we've been able to uh, convince some Pickering and, and Wrangells to come down and join us here. And, and they've done exceptionally well. But as far as really cracking this nut in our admissions, uh, we, we have not, as, as the chart I showed, uh, we, we've not been able to do it. Uh, Sylvia, and then I've got a question uh, that I'll read from Hank. But Sylvia, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Larry, for your presentation. Thank um, you, Sylvia. But one of the I things I noted is that the 
State Department's ranking in the uh, Partnership for Public Service ratings has been lower in recent years. We used to be at the top of the good places to work and popular places to work. So I think overall, there is still what we must admit is a issue with the State Department culture and how welcoming our culture is and open to change. Um, the expectations of people coming in are such as many young people, minorities or whatever, uh, expect to progress faster than it's going to be possible. So in that, I think that it is essential that we do more mentoring, that the mentoring is a crucial part. I also think that uh, we might want to take another look at our internship program since it's a good way to see what it's like before you enter, working alongside foreign and civil service personnel in the department. But African-Americans and students usually have to work. They cannot afford to take that summer off unless we make it uh, possible for them to intern and do so. Remote internships are fine, but there's nothing like being in the department. Uh, so therefore, I would also like to suggest that we need to really, the people who are recruiting, the diplomats and residents, uh, many people don't see that as a career enhancing assignment. So we need to really give greater weight to finding ways to get those recruiters out or get people from the desk to take a, a, a week out to go to their schools and more funds that are for that. But the culture, mentoring and our own uh, practices. Thank you very much. Thank you again for the presentation and your work in my home state. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sylvia. That's, re that's really wonderful. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more. We have got to do something about our, and we've gone backwards on our uh, State Department uh, internship programs. When I was a DIR uh, the year, uh, uh, my last year in the Foreign Service, uh, 2004-05, and then in the early years when I was here at the Bush School, we actually had uh, paid internships. Uh, not all of them were paid, but some of the State Department internships were paid, and then that that went away. I can't remember in which, but which of the budget crunch years, which of the, you know, when we went down to the uh, final days and government shutdowns, and they, it got, it, it went by the by the by the boards. Uh, that is something we got to restore. We have got to make it possible to uh, pay our interns, or at least to offer them a stipend that. Uh, maybe it wouldn't uh, could uh, uh, take care of all the expenses of living in Washington, D.C. or a plane ticket to a foreign uh, embassy or a consulate, uh, but it can help. And uh, it's certainly something we, sh we uh, could do and should and must do because many agencies within the U.S. government do offer paid internships and almost any uh, self-respecting private, private uh, firm will do so. So, um, you know, we, we got to fix that. There is a bill. Uh, I think it was Castro's in the House. So when yeah. I sent uh, the okay. message for them, I had to not wait. I'm going. She's still no. working. It has gotten out of the, out of the uh, I'm not even sure if it's got out of the full house yet, but there is a, there is a bill pending which would do that. Uh, Hank Cohen had a question about whether your students demonstrate curiosity. Well, uh, as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, yes, I think they do. Uh, they're open to differing views. They are intellectually curious. They don't, they don't uh, tend to come in with uh, all the answers uh, to life's puzzles or to the uh, puzzle of diplomacy. Uh, and I think they are, they are, they are in the main open-minded. And as I said, I, I am refreshingly, uh, they are refreshingly less dogmatic politically and, uh, and, and less uh, prone to, you know, hand-to-hand -hand partisan combat than their elders, I think. Maybe they'll get that way with age. Uh, yeah, if, we, if we're if we around us long enough, or, you know, people of our age and, and in the intervening generations, we'll fix them. Yeah. Deborah. Thank you. Uh, Larry, thank you for your remarks. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. One, in the groups that you have mentored, the students you've had, 
Have any, do they ever mention the pay gap between the private and public sector? The last time we had a true adjustment in the gap was when just before I came in a thousand years ago. So pay is something that we don't really talk about. We talk about service and so forth, but pay also plays a role. And the second question is, is today, I think it's very hard to expect that young people will serve a 20 or 30 year career. Their time horizons are shorter. And somehow we don't adjust to the fact that if someone comes in, if they do seven, 10 years and then go on and do something else, that's not necessarily bad. They're not all leaving, despite some reports, being dissatisfied. Often they leave, frankly, for better pay and not moving. So we too, I think, have to adjust a little bit. But I wanted to know amongst your students whether the issue of pay and the time frame from which they were willing to serve have, have come up. Uh, Deborah, the, it's good to see you. The, the, the issue of time, pay does seldom comes up, frankly. Um, they, 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 you know, they, they have some idea of what our, uh, what the state department's pay scale is. And, uh, many of them know they can make a lot more in, in the private sector and many, you know, some will, will, uh, will do that. Uh, but I find at least down here and at the Bush school that, uh, they're not so much looking for that as they are looking to somehow, some way get, find somebody who'll give them the first opportunity they have in public service uh, to get on the lower rung of the ladder and, and try to navigate navigate forward. So uh, there's that. Now, I do think the second issue you raised is a tough one uh, for us because the foreign service career has always been, well, you start out like in the military, you start out as a second lieutenant and, you, you know, you you pursue a 20 or 25 year career and you get where you can as in the senior foreign service and, and, and the, Young people are much more mobile than that right now. They want to be able to move in and out if they if they want to uh, to take a, a break of a year or two, even uh, to take care of an elder elderly parent or to uh, raise a, a, a child or deal with some special needs or something. They want to be able to do that. And so, if we're going to retain as many of people as we can, we got to have a lot more flexibility in the system than we had when we were navigating it. Uh, and we've, we've got to have more, more capacity, more willingness, more uh, empathy for those kinds of, of issues and, and allow people to, you know, to, to take advantage of some of those opportunities. Now, in order to do that, you've got to have enough leeway in the force to, to allow it. And we just have never had that kind of top cover in the, in the diplomatic uh, uh, force as we have in the military, where you can have a 10% 10% of the officer corps out studying or out for one reason or another um, in a given year or in a given period of time. So unless, until we can get that kind of uh, top, top cover, it's gonna to be tough for us to, you know, to, to deal with that kind of issue. Let's see, I've got Dennis, and then I've got one in the chat from Marie, and then I've got Chet. Okay, Dennis, please go ahead. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Larry. Interesting presentation. I had to shudder, though, when you mentioned ROTC. I think uh, that was the worst idea of many bad ideas in the Belfer report. Uh, you just can't identify somebody at 18 who's going to be a future successful foreign service officer. We have a hard enough time doing that with people who are an average of 30 years or so master's degree. <laughs> six years of work experience. That's the profile of the average uh, junior officer coming in now. But two things that I think that could be done. One is uh, expand the Wrangle program even more. I know it's gonna grow, but it should grow a lot more. I think one of the things that we should recognize is that um, the minority recruitment is not just a State Department problem, it's a societal problem because people, uh, minorities suffer from worse public education, worse economic conditions. Uh, your chances for going to college and success in college depend a lot on whether your parents went to college. And so that's a, a problem that the State Department can't really deal with. But I think being more generous with uh, uh, graduate um, uh, programs, uh, programs to fellowships and scholarships or graduate programs would be a lot more effective than throwing money at an 18 year old with the hope that that person 
uh, four or five or six years later might actually figure out that they want to do uh, the State Department as a career. The other thing I would recommend as far as uh, recruitment, you know, the uh, military had a problem with getting people to serve in joint commands. Uh, and it wasn't looked at as career enhancing. And we had a little war in Grenada where none of the armed services could talk to each other. And that was part of the reason why it was such a debacle. And so Goldwater Nichols said, OK, if you want to become a general, you have to serve in joint command. I think what we ought to do in the State Department uh, is if you want to be in the senior foreign service, you have to do a Pearson program assignment. You have to go out into the hinterland and recruit uh, people for the Foreign Service and also connect with the average American and tell them why uh, the State Department matters. One of the things that we always bemoan is that people out there don't understand us, don't understand diplomacy, don't understand what we do and why it's important. And so we need a lot more people out there, but a Pearson program is not career enhancing. And the only way to make it career enhancing is to require it for your career to advance. Thanks. Great, Dennis. Great to hear, uh, hear from you and thank you for weighing in. Um, I certainly agree with you that we should expand uh, further the, the Pearson and Rangel uh, programs. There was an expansion uh, a year or so ago. Needs to, we need to think about doing even more in that regard. And I do like the idea of getting more of our people out uh, to, to uh, 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 to speak and to uh, interact with uh, with our population. We, we're going to have a number of questions. Uh, you know, there are some issues here that we're not going to do today, but that bear on these things. There are several questions about what people ought to have to do to get in the senior service, and the Pearson is one. The functional bureaus is another. Um, Remember, when you put those on the table, those are probably... 10 year leads by the time you grandfather people who will no longer have the opportunity and look at the number of slots. Uh, I raise that only because a lot of these ideas have very long tails and, and very heavy resource commitments, which often I think we haven't staffed out uh, and the Congress hasn't staffed out. So there's gonna have to be a lot of homework there. Maureen had a question. She said she would be interested in suggestions on advice for students, the best entry points today, what's the best advice to prepare for the FSO exam. Uh, I know in my day that was uh, read The Economist, The New York Times for a year and get a good night's sleep. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, some of my students have done state in department internships, others have entered via Pickering uh, Fellows and the like. So suggestions for students who want to enter the foreign service. And uh, let's just go around, Larry, and then if others want to get in on that, um, we'll, we'll do a quick sweep around. Well, on the, uh, on the foreign service exam process, what I always tell my students is, there's no way you can study for the standardized FSOT. You've been in school for a long time. You've, you've, uh, taught, you've uh, taken a lot of standardized tests. You're a good test, test taker, just go and take it. And, and uh, you'll probably, and in fact, most of our students here and most of yours will pass, can pass the standardized exam, which is the Gateway Foreign Service Officer Test. The problem where my students in, encounter is in the, uh, the so-called personal narratives that you're asked to uh, submit at the same time you take the standardized exam. These are narratives which uh, uh, test or at least assay your, uh, somebody's experience and they ask you to tell a lot of stories uh, about your experience as they illustrate at, uh, um, aspects of uh, character and temperament that are judged to be essential to the foreign service. To do that, you've got to have some experience in the rucksack, labeled experience on the back that everybody's carrying around. And if you don't have a lot in there, it's it's difficult to, to write those narratives uh, that are going to be compared against the narratives that everybody else is submitting. So uh, if you can help your students show what they've got, whatever it is, and write those narratives, that's where I think we can be the most helpful in the Foreign Service exam process, to help them get a chance to get to the oral assessment. Uh, because 
really those part those uh, those narratives are what <laughs> is the stage at which they are eliminating most of the people from even getting a shot at the oral assessment. That is very helpful, Larry. Thank you. Um, and by the way, Laura Kennedy has put into the chat a note on where the Castro bill stands on paid internships. So I call your attention to the chat. Before I go on to chat, did anyone else want to chime in on the advice for students? I think Marcy. Marcy, saying. were you trying to get in on that? Yeah. Oh, she was the first of the question. No, different question. Okay. Um, in that case, uh, Chet, you've got the next one. Well, thank you, Larry, very much for your comments. And I want to identify with your point about the, the quality of today's students. I've been uh, teaching for about 50 years with a short interruption uh, for government service in the State Department, where you and I met. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and apart from, from that, I, I guess I would say today's students are, are they, they, really, they really push their professors <clears throat> and they're very, they're very um, uh, uh, high quality, they're, they're very motivated. They do amazing kinds of research that we could never do in our day. The only problem with their incredible uh, technology skills is that they believe what they see in Google far too often. But um, but they are very, very high quality. And, uh, and that, that's not really the problem. When it comes to the level of interest in government service and in the foreign service particularly, uh, I think we have to recognize some difficult political realities. One of them is the over-militarization of our foreign policy, which many people uh, on this program will be familiar with and will probably have commented on at great length. But when you see the, the role models of, of what's going on in our foreign policy and the extent to which we, we tend to resort to the military as the answer to problems that are not military problems at all, it's kind of discouraging. It doesn't create the right, the right uh, role models. And then you look at what's going on in the Senate today and there's 80 people held up in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, that's, that's kind of off-putting. Um, and when you look at you know what uh, what what goes on with the what's said about the State Department compared to the military by our political leaders uh, uh, and 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 so on, I think it's 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 something that has to be fixed. It's been a long time since we really had a, a leadership in the White House and in the State Department that that made the point about the importance of the State Department and diplomacy just doesn't have the same. A set of attraction points uh, to it as far as the American people, they don't understand it. It involves compromise, it involves dealing with nasty people, it involves talking to nasty people, <laughs> it involves engaging with them, not because you like them or you agree with them, but because they need to listen to you and you need to listen to them, <laughs> right? So I, I think part, part of it is, is simply that we, as a society, we really have a problem here. When it comes to minority recruitment, I had a, a couple of comments. One is that uh, the Foreign Service still recruits very heavily from schools that are very damned expensive. <laughs> and therefore, we need more fellowships and more scholarships to be able to support more minority recruitment. I know at my university, Georgetown, that's a huge problem. And we haven't solved it. Um, just like you were saying, you haven't solved it at, at the Bush School. Um, so that's one issue. Another issue which has been alluded to is training. I think training is really the brand of the, of the military. The uniformed military really, really understand about training. Uh, we still believe in OJT uh, so often in the Foreign Service and in the, in the State Department more generally. Um, I know I was trained on the job and <laughs> I was trained by guys like you, Larry. <laughs> So, so, uh, but I think for a lot of people who are thinking about a career, one of the things that's attractive about a career, let's say at Goldman Sachs or in the, in the Marine Corps, is that you'll learn something that might, be trans, might translate into a, 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 a career after you finished. So uh, I really think the State Department needs to pull up its socks on, on training, including mid-career mid training and senior training. That's it for me. Thank you, Larry. 
Uh, Chad, thank you so much. It's so good to see you uh, and, uh, and, to, and to hear from you on this. And I agree with you on a, everything that you've said, especially on, on the need for uh, uh, training. And it's, it's very difficult, again, for the State Department to have the kind of training uh, profile that is available to the military and to people like Goldman Sachs, unless you have a, you know, that, 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 float. Person, yeah. that float that allows you to do it. Uh, so, um, yeah, great. And great to see you. Uh, Marcy is next. I just want to note, though, before we get too discouraged on the Trump years uh, or how diplomats were treated, that there's a, uh, there was an article of George Kennan's, which is, 1961 speech reprinted the Foreign Service Journal a few years ago, and it bears reminding that in 1961, Kennan noted various, for these reasons, diplomacy is always going to consist to some extent of serving people who do not know that they are being served, who do not know that they need to be served, who <laughs> misunderstand and abuse the very effort to serve them. So let's not get too discouraged. <laughs> That's exactly right. And that was some of the points that Chet was just making, uh, only uh, in Kennan's sort of pithy way, right? Yeah. That's 19, <laughs> that speech is 1961. So, you know, and uh, as I used to remind people, John Paul Jones finished his career running Catherine the Great. A Black Sea Fleet because he couldn't get a pension from the Continental Congress. So we have a long tradition of not treating our civil servants terribly well. And if you want it to be terribly different, go do something else. Um, and, and then work to make it better. I agree. <laughs> but moaning. So, Marcy, over to you. Thanks. Um, Larry, again, thanks so much for doing this. Um, a lot of us teach or mentor, and, and it really is very helpful and much appreciated. I, I, I also agreed with a lot of what Chet's had to say, and especially the part about training. Um, and we did a lot of lesson, listening in uh, the Belfer project, and two things that we heard over and over and over again was that the assignments and promotion process was so opaque and um, difficult to navigate and uh, based on an old boy network and that people could not advance. At the same time, we also heard from um, some, of, some of all of your colleagues uh, who teach now that uh, students uh, really felt that they um, might have a better chance of exercising leadership or affecting foreign policy or even uh, of, of service uh, to, uh, and of government service if they took a political route. And this, um, this, this idea was, uh, was um, made even more manifest, I might say, by uh, the increasing number of uh, political appointments that we have. I'm talking about in the State Department. I'm not talking about just ambassadorships. I'm talking about deputy assistant secretaries and so on. And I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, Larry, um, your students exhibit this perception that maybe there's a better route than the Foreign Service. Uh, you know, Marcy, thank you very much. Uh, I don't I don't tend to hear that an awful lot from, from my students uh, because I think most of them can't, they may not be able to think their way through uh, the, or, or believe that they can navigate through the foreign service uh, officer test or whatever uh, hiring process of any other foreign affairs agency, but they really don't th know that they know a politician well enough who's gonna be well-placed enough to get them a political appointment. So, um, you know, some will, maybe gravitate in that direction, but I, 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 I think most of my students, at least down here, uh, still believe in the, in the public service, uh, the, the nonpartisan public service route. Hmm. Good to hear. This has been great. I know we're running out of time. I, I, I'm listening to this, looking at Deborah's comment. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that many people seem to hold two what seemed to me contrary impressions simultaneously. One is the criticism of decisions made at the policy level 
without taking into account experience, without knowing anything about foreigners and without knowing how to run things. We've been hearing a lot of that lately on Afghanistan and simultaneously the view of the young that they should instantly be in a position to do the same thing. Um, <laughs> I and, uh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I suppose that we will just have to live with that, but um, yeah, it, it does, I, I think this is a subject we'll come back to many times. It, it certainly raises the question of whether every desire should be accommodated, and which ones have to be in preserving and improving the institution. So you've given us a lot to think about, and I suspect we could go on quite a while. And I look forward to the day when we could do more of these in person where we certainly would carry on because you couldn't stop us. Uh, so, Larry, thank you very much for doing this, for taking us, you know, in a different direction for the discussions that's well worth having. And uh, we will, we will put it, uh, oh, Susan, you're trying, were, were you trying to get in there? Did I cut you off? No, was I was a, just clapping. I was, that was a clap. That wasn't raising. I, I <laughs> thank you for that, Susan. I, I I'll do it this hands. way. So, thank you all very much. And Maria, what's the next? What do we have coming up? Yes. I don't believe. I don't know. No, we we got a couple of weeks. We got some people on tap that we've been trying to settle dates for. Uh, but it, I will take the opportunity to remind you if you have subjects you think you'd like to hear us address in these things, uh, please drop uh, me or Maria a note or if there are people you think we should particularly try to get to talk to us, please drop us a note on that. And uh, we will continue to do these. We're alternating a little bit as we go into the fall where we have had, uh, where we're doing in-person programs like uh, last week, Maria and I were both out at uh, Chapel Hill for a very good program we did there. And uh, we've got some more things coming up, so we'll we'll kind of have to hopscotch around those a little bit. But we want to keep this going since people seem to enjoy it. So do give us your notions, and we'll try to work them in. Right, Maria. Thank you so much for your help with the tech and with setting up and everything. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Who is that chat from? Mark Kennedy. Okay, the one but not right regarding commitments and the yeah. importance of training and getting ourselves around the country. Mm -hmm. I just thought they'd enjoy that 1961 quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thanks to everyone. Larry, it was great. Thank you. This it, was was of, it was a lot of fun. And uh, right. Zoom, does, Zoom does give us some uh, ability to move folks in from a little further away. So this is outstanding. And, you, and you've been so consistent about tuning in from a long way away as well. So. Uh, this was a double pleasure. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>